Hermitcraft Recap presents a short story of avian betrayal. I've got my barra back. I haven't heard him since the first of the season. Well, second of the season. I didn't kill my parrot when I found him accidentally by chopping him in half on a tree. I never would do that. Never. I don't know what you're talking about. I gave him a die job. It's fine. Welcome to the Hermitcraft Recap. My name is Pixel Riffs, our writer is XP, and as per usual, we are eager to see the results of the recap tag we put on iJebin last week. I tried to read the comments on the yesterday's video and like them and stuff, but there was so much spam from Hermitcraft Recap spamming my channel with, with comments. Guys, I'm not mad about that. I thought it was hilarious. Oh. Oh, he's not actually that miffed about it. Well, at least we got some hilarious comments by you guys. And it's a good thing we're still doing our game of tag, because Hermitcraft's own tag game seems to have shenaniganed itself into a corner. Because this week, in trying to get rid of the dunce head, Azuma tagged none other than Evil X himself. It turns out he's been stalking Azuma for the entire season, which no one has called out in the comments because his appearances were less like appearances and more like a pixel hunting challenge. Some viewers have taken an issue to this, but rest assured, Azuma is not going to get away that easily. Not on our watch. So right now we're taking iJevin's recap tag and putting it right onto Azuma. Head to the video linked in the iCards and in the comments we'll have a little competition to see who can misspell good old Shashwami's username the best. Just write whatever comment you feel like, but butcher X's name when addressing him. <laughs> we sound a little bit stupid. Yeah, we should probably stop now. And with that out of the way, let's take a look at all the events and mishaps that occurred on the Hermitcraft server this week. Beginning with Stress Monster, who might have a few bones to pick with people who've been mining ice from the frozen oceans. Her shop has sold a single stack of packed ice, and yet all these hermits seem to have some in their inventories and redstone contraptions. Beware the wrath of the Ice Queen, ye hermits! Although Stress is slightly less intimidating when she almost dies trying to get upstairs in iJevin's house. Turns out those ladders work both ways. We actually- this is- ah! Oh! Oh! No! Oh, no! Oh! <laughs> okay, it's fine. I'm good. Nothing happened. Back at her snowbound fort, she frames out some windows, completes more walls, and installs soda streams that transport her up and down from the storage room in her iceberg. A much less conventional use for bubble columns is presented by the duo of ZF and Tango Tech. This week, the former aerial sheep service enthusiastically presents the least convenient chicken farm ever. We we're too busy about worrying about whether we could. We never decided if we should. <laughs> <laughs> and just when you thought that this couldn't get any worse, they attached a flamethrower to it. Thankfully, this is not the only product of Tango's ingenuity. Later into the week, striving to solve the lack of insta-mining this season, Mr. Tech has developed a new spin on Wither Skeleton farming technology. This farm operates on you running back and forth in a special tunnel, actively luring skeletons to their killing chambers, while letting the rest of the baddies despawn on the sidewalk. It is even ice boat compatible or at least it was, as Mojang and their version quirks strike again. By now, the Hermitcraft server is running the 1.13.1 update, and one issue people have already noticed is that exiting a boat is glitchy. So on a one thick packed ice bridge, you just glitch through and fall to your inevitable doom. Particularly, it was noticed by Cubfan, who lost all his items in this exact fashion. He did make it to a fortress pillar before dying, just couldn't find the right one in the five minute despawn timer. This was it. It was this one. Yep, there's the stuff missing right here. And it's already been five minutes. Knowing Cub, it's only a slight speed bump on his road to gather a dozen beacons he wants for his next project, which turns out to be the return of Cub Quest. But that's in the far future, so no info on it just yet. The project that is completed this week is his dolphin superhighway to the Guardian farm. The mystery of disappearing dolphins turns out to be a positioning bug, making them suffocate into a wall when trapped in a one by one environment, which is easily solved by giving them more room to breathe. Despite his partner in Con, Scar, not being around, Cub begins working on the Concorp area. For a start, he puts together a nano farm and a multi tier manual tree farm. False Symmetry is also hit hard by the 1.13.1 update, in a way that sort of sneaks up on her. 
One change brought about by this update is that squid will only spawn in river and ocean biomes. Knowing that, Falsa set out to build a river-based ink farm, digging it out and draining water around it. The problem is that the farm design she went for, infamously, only works in 1.13. The waterlogged stairs will stop spawning squids in them basically right after her video about the farm came out. Maybe that's fate's way of avenging the ocean monument she recently wrecked. Or perhaps it's karma for what she unknowingly inflicted on Joe Hills, who logged out at her base only to log back in 20 blocks lower than he expected and with nothing to help him get out. But that's only the beginning of his struggles. Joe makes his escape only to find himself in the existential horror of a flattened nether hub. They paved the opposite of paradise and put up a parking lot. Look at this, guys. This is a travesty. Joe doesn't have enough materials on him to build a pink hotel, a boutique, and a swinging hotspot, but he does grab some red terracotta from the mining mesa and graffiti the walls of the nether hub with a heart, before doing some kind of modern art thing with glass blocks and encouraging his fellow hermits to indulge their artistic side in this terrifying wasteland of stone brick slabs. Impulse SV is above it all. No, quite literally, he's above it all. Having broken through the nether roof last week, this week he's casually built an entire gold farm off camera, all in the name of gathering XP while epic music plays in the background. Now his pockets are overflowing with yet another kind of cash, he's able to restock his loot box vending machine, although this time the prizes are a little more economical. He's also getting into the kelp farming business back at his base, having heard that kelp is a pretty decent fuel source, and pretty soon there's a whole room dedicated to farming it, cooking it, and then cooking it again for good measure. There it is, just fired. You see him just come shooting out the gap like I explained. Azuma follows suit, but on a more industrial level. His farm is a big glass box on the bottom near the ocean, with a literal pipeline sticking out of it. The trapdoor pipes drop harvested kelp right into a multi-furnace oven, where it is dried for future use as fuel or snack. The one block high hijinks are expanded upon when he demonstrates so-called dive mining, a technique allowing one to swim through the smallest tunnels possible and mine more efficiently, so elytra mining, just less expensive. TFC doesn't need these newfangled mining methods, his branch mine is a traditional affair, minecart powered and growing larger every day. But he's starting to need a lot of chests to store all of this leftover rock, so much of this week is spent setting up an auto-filtered storage system, which can eventually expand until it will sort through and even automatically smelt anything he happens to dig up. The vault also gets some fancy sea lanterns courtesy of Iskal's shop, but while investigating the rest of the shopping district, TFC finds himself entangled with a more troublesome light source. Grian's pickle shop has already claimed several victims this week, some like Doc M actually dying in their attempts to escape, while others like TFC simply wishing they were dead after reading all the bad jokes. But one hermit decided there weren't enough jokes yet, so he made the pickle into a face. In the aftermath of Hermitcraft livestream day, Iskull introduces his audience to Harry Pickle. <laughs> oh my goodness, it's even derpier now that I log back on. <laughs> but as Iskull points out, at least it's not a bumbo. After dredging the ocean floor around his base and replacing it with more Iskallium, he decides to head out in search of an area with better ore generation than the pre-releases they used to launch the server. Heading out into the previously undiscovered chunks, Iskall sets up a quarry, both as a fancy mega build and as a practical mining area. Much like TFC, he has plans to make the area a little more minecart powered, although his approach includes more modern touches, like a shulker box loading system for all the bulky resources, and invisible armor stands indicating which materials go where. But it's still less convenient than just having Grian bring you the stuff you need. It's been so bad, I just need as much as I can get my hands on. I got to know, what on earth are you making that needs this much? I Jevin dips his toes into the complex machinery this week, both with his iron farm array nearly finished and perfectly functional until 1.13.1 came around of course, and a brand new redstone marvel, an automated potion maker, or rather a potion assembler since you still have to choose ingredients manually by clicking the buttons, it just narrows the input from 3 clicks per ingredient into 1. It's more convenient, much like Jevin's railroad to the Skelly Farm. Now you don't need a minecart at all, just hop into the submerged tunnel and torpedo to the other side. The entire thing is conduit powered and soon to be dolphinized. 
The cobble bought from Grian is used on the Mega Build area. It starts with a watchtower and a fortress wall coming from it. And while Jevin might not feel too confident in his building skills, this castle probably won't end up blown up like the one he made in Season 4. The door-to-door -door cobble sales going well, Grian returns to his coffee mug of a base to once again expand it upwards and onwards, plus seeding the ocean floor with sea pickles. Thankfully, the internet had a convenient pickle farm design laying around. The glowing cucumber business goes especially well for him, not just because someone has actually bought something, but also because people died, and that's always fun. Doc M couldn't agree more. No! No! Two hits and you're out. Two hits and you're out. Oh, I'm safe underwater. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness, let's regenerate. No, I think I'm underwater! You're definitely not safe underwater. This week sees the completion of Phantom Death Run, and the Hermits are already queuing up to try it out and sign the guest book. We'll probably do a compilation of these, but the highlight is undoubtedly Biffa, who gets taken out no less than four times before splashing his way to victory. How do I get through? Yes! We made it! Oh my goodness, we did it. Wow! Yay! Rejoice, and there was much rejoicing. The rest of his week is a little more chill, with a Q&A episode and some work on the monument base, but then Python comes a-knocking with Abba caving on his mind, and soon enough Biffa is once again surrounded by things that are trying to kill him. <gasps> oh! <laughs> There's creepers everywhere! Help! <laughs> I'm not all gonna die! <laughs> Python also has a go at Phantom Death Run later in the week with a little more success, and success seems to be following him from the commercial district, where his shulkerbox shop is still bringing in the cash. The flower pot shop, not so much, although Tango drops by and snaps up some later in the week, but Python decides he needs a new business strategy, so some flash sales of ender chest and other end related loot start popping up alongside those shulker boxes. He even attempts a little market research at other stores, but like many others, ends up having to claw his way out of Grian's big green death trap. Dog appreciates the puns at the pickle shop almost as much as his face appreciates the wall when he smashes into it, but if there is a lawsuit coming on that score, it hasn't happened yet. For now, Doc is concerned with vegetable matter of his own. Needing a new get-rich-quick scheme after Rendog is the only hermit so far to gamble his diamonds at the Trident shop, Doc decides to harvest the natural resources at his mushroom island and sets up a farm for mushroom blocks. At least it gives him something to do while he listens to the distant screams of the hermits meeting the phantoms. Speaking of distant screams, Zombie Cleo, having definitely not murdered her parrot, continues her pirate escapades through the mystical quest to the Isle of Tortuga. It's supposed to be a secret pirate fortress island, capable of withstanding a proper cannonball to the face, which is why Cleo lays the foundations of Tortilla with a couple of watchtowers and a nice wall greeting the sailors. There is a wooden dock on the shore too, but seeing as how her ship still has its sails up, it's only passing the area and not actually harbouring in it. So that's a fun continuity mess. On the mainland, the pirate riches finally chip in for an eye trade pass. Finding a mending book with a curse of vanishing on it in Biffa's shop was the straw that broke the zombie's back. Mumbo is founding a land of his own. Four lands, in fact. Kind of like a four cheese pizza, only with biomes instead of mozzarella. I was hungry when I wrote this, okay? It works. But he's having trouble figuring out the other toppings, as someone who's unfamiliar with the process of terraforming. This is, is this what we do? Is this, is this what one does to terraform nice? He gets the hang of it eventually, and luckily Grian is around to help him transform one of the quadrants into a tropical oasis complete with palm trees. He even tries to add a sprinkling of coral purchased from Cubfan's shop, despite being a little scared of Cubfan after getting the eviction notice from the convex. The end result is satisfying, but Mumbo acknowledges that when it comes to landscaping, he's got a lot to learn. Is Grian no, no. questions the usefulness of a beacon? <laughs> beacon suck! <laughs> And finally, there's Wells Knight, with the opposite goal, becoming more better at that electrical dust stuff. For a starter mechanization project, he builds a two-block-high flower farm, doubling as a community dyeing service, so very much like Doc's Phantom Cave, which he nails first try, by the way. Uh, Wells did it in episode 27. He did it in... Is it, he did... 
I shouldn't have looked at that, should I? Now, now I just like have zero deaths to beat. Feeling generous, Mr. Two Diamonds for Shears drops another community service, the Mail Station, with comparators and lights, no less. This one gets trolled before it even opens, when someone drops rotten flesh into every single mailbox. But never mind that, it's just spam. This is where Wells runs out of bricks properly and resorts to a creative single-player world for build sketching. If you ever wanted to peek behind the curtain and find out how to plan your build, check this one out. Wells pretty much guides you step by step. Just be warned, it's a modern style house, so get ready for a lot of rectangles. And that's just about it for this week's recap. Our writer is Zloy XP, and my name is Pixel Riffs. If you missed it on our community tab, Zloy posted a video about who exactly built Minecraft's ocean monuments and end cities. Bring your tinfoil hats, it's definitely worth watching. Don't forget to leave a like while you're still here, and subscribe so you won't miss future recaps. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week. Pickles on the sea floor, pickles. Pickles on the sea floor, pickles. Pickles on the sea 